what happened with the the losses on the first mission mm -hmm. our second mission is that the new crew straggled from the formation at high altitude with a heavy airplane. We had never had any training in flying a very heavy airplane at very high altitude in a tight formation. Now we had flown formation and we'd flown at high altitude with a light airplane back in our training, but we never had that combination. Heavy airplane, high altitude, tight formation. First time up there, they straggled from the formation and got picked off. That's what happened to my crew. They straggled. They were up over Bremen, Germany, and and uh, dropped their bombs and straggled from the formation as it made the turn away and got picked off. The first time I got the controls up there, I did the same thing. But I learned very quickly. <laughs> Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Back in February, while I was at the Pima Air and Space Museum, I was running a bit late for my last interview, and as I rushed back into the conference center, there's a strapping six foot tall gentleman wearing the most wonderful A2 and a baseball cap. That was the fabulous Colonel Richard Bouchon. U.S. Army Air Force and U.S. Air Force retired. Now, Dick is now 100 years young, and every Thursday he goes to the 390th Memorial Museum, which is the memorial museum for the unit he flew with in the 8th Air Force, pulls up a chair, sits down by the B-17 they have there, and tells stories, answers people's questions. And he very kindly gave a chunk of his Thursday afternoon to chat to me and by extension to all you good listeners of the Damcasters. And I have to say, it's a bit of a treat. Dick is fantastic. We're going to talk about flying B-17s. We're going to talk about his impressions of the 100th Bomb Group. We're going to talk about Korea, supply issues, all kinds of things come in. F-111s, he had a career. But... You cannot start a story of the 390th without talking about the bear. Over to Dick. They called it Roscoe. <laughs> and so this little baby bear flew over to England in the radio compartment of a B-17 with the 569th Squadron. <laughs> and that was the mascot of the squadron, Roscoe. <laughs> When they got to England, they found out it was a girl bear. <laughs> so they changed the name to Roscoe Ann. <laughs> so, so Roscoe Ann was the mascot of the 569. How big did it get? It got pretty big. <laughs> That's a problem with baby bears. They grow up to be big bears. Well, it got up about this high. And, you know, it was pretty husky, and it was very friendly because the kids played with it all the time. You know, they had it, it was in back of the orderly room of the squadron, and they'd get out there and wrestle with it, and they <laughs> fed it and petted it, and it was really tame, and it loved people. <laughs> One day, somebody didn't fasten the chain properly, and the little bear got loose. It was no longer a little bear. <laughs> and it wandered into town. This little town was right near our base. And a church service was going on with the doors open. The people were singing and the little bear, I can just imagine it's thinking, oh, there's a lot of people. I love to play with people. <laughs> and so it wandered into church. And everybody wandered out very <laughs> rapidly out the other end of church. Well, the little bear followed them out there, and it was being playful and climbed up a tree and was bobbing around, <laughs> and it got shot. So oh, no. that was the end of our mascot, <laughs> yeah. That was the last of it. <laughs> oh, poor thing. Um, the, the first question I have to ask is the question I ask everybody. 
which is when I get to introduce you. How would you like to be introduced, sir? Well, <laughs> I, I can't Join us. Join us. No, come on over. Join us. You don't have to sit in the corner. We'll just wave at you. I kid about it. I could be called Colonel Bouchon or Sir Richard. <laughs> I, I was uh, awarded the Legion of Honor from France. Yeah. And Chevalier Richard. Yeah. And so when, <laughs> when I got it, it's in parentheses, it said knight. <laughs> so I showed that to my younger girlfriend. She's 95. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, from now on, you have to call me Sir Richard. <laughs> well, Sir Richard. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd love to well, start at the beginning. Where, 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 were you, where are you from? I grew up in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I graduated from high school and went. Uh, my home was in a little town named St. Mary's. 60 miles north of Dayton. And Dayton is where Wright Field and Patterson mm -hmm. Field are. And I went down there to get a job at Wright Field. And I got a job, OK? And I had acquired a secret clearance. So I was able to handle classified material. And so I, my job was delivering and picking up classified material from the chiefs of staff of the Air Service Command. Mm -hmm. Now, there were five chiefs of staff, the, the various sections. They were all full colonels at that time. And one of the aides of one of those colonels was a captain and had big pilot's wings. All of them probably were rated, I don't remember. But he kept, when the war started, I was there when working when the war started. And so he said, uh, you ought to get into the aviation cadet program. Well, the requirement to get into the aviation cadet program was two years of college or pass a test. <laughs> I kept resisting because I knew that test had to be pretty tough. I said, oh, I, I don't think I could pass. You sure can. So he got to know me pretty well. Finally, I went over and applied for it and got to take the test, and I passed. Uh, 24 took it that day and four passed. Wow. So it was a pretty tough test. It was all day long, all day. And then they said, okay, you passed, come back tomorrow for your physical. The day I took the test, I was 18. The next day was my birthday. <laughs> I was 19 when I took the physical and passed that. And they said, okay, we'll call you. <laughs> so I went back to work and uh, still at Wright Field as a civil servant. So about, oh, I guess it was three or four weeks later, uh, I got a call from Patterson Field where the testing was done. Come back over and get sworn in. Okay. So I went back over and the guy said, stand right there and hold up your right hand. I did. He swore me in and he said, you're now a private in the army. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. That wasn't what I wanted. I wanted to get into the cadet program, the aviation cadet. Well, this is just till we get an opening in the cadet. So he gave me a piece of paper that had my name, serial number. <laughs> I'm now in the army. I got a serial number. And it said PVT on leave piece of official looking paper said here. So I went back over to my office and I told my boss, I'm in the army. My boss said, you are, you've got to quit your job. You can't have two government jobs at the same time. So I quit my job and went home to my, where my parents live. And it was about 60 miles north of there. And so now I'm living with my parents in civilian clothes 
the war is going on, the draft board called me and said, hey, you got to come down and register for the draft. You haven't registered. I said, no, I don't. I'm already in the Army. They said, sure you are. You're living at home, civilian calls. So I went down. And I knew them. There were four people there. I knew them all, small town. I said, no, I really am in the Army. They all shook their head. I got out my little piece of paper and handed it to the first one, and they all had to read it. And then they finally said, well, I guess he is. <laughs> we can't draft him. <laughs> so it was a couple more weeks in until they called me to, uh, to come and get into the cadet program. When I got there, they said, you're now appointed as a cadet, a aviation cadet. So the, the pay jumped. Tremendously. <laughs> $21 a month was what a private got. And uh, a cadet got $75. Wow. <laughs> that is a jump. Yeah. So I was now an aviation cadet. And from there, I had to go to what they call classification center <laughs> to be classified either pilot, co a pilot, navigator, or bombardier. They ran us through a lot of tests, both uh, physical and mental tests, to decide which school you were going to go to. To be a pilot, you had that perfect vision, and depth perception was very important. Hand-eye coordination was extremely important. So they tested all of those things, and I was selected for pilot school. So. So the navigators and engineers would say that you didn't do as well on the math. <laughs> That's probably right. Navigator, bombardier, yeah, yeah. So uh, maybe not, but anyhow, <laughs> I I wanted to be a pilot, so they, I got selected for pilot training. Then they sent me down to Texas mm. to get, wait for an opening for yep. at pilot school, and so I got started pilot school there. There were four phases in pilot school. When, when, when was that? What year? That was in 1942. <laughs> yeah. And I graduated in the uh, end of July of 1943, uh, 29th of July, and got a couple of weeks to go home and show off my new wings and second lieutenant smart. <laughs> and and I, they, during advanced training, which for me, was twin engine mm -hmm. advanced because I was six feet tall and they, all the tall guys went to twin engine advanced because we were going to go to bigger airplane, not the fighters. The fighters were pretty small in those days. And so in advanced training, they asked, what airplane would you like to go to? <laughs> And I asked for B-17s. I thought they were a beautiful airplane up in the air. And I didn't know they were going to be shooting at me within a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> but there I went straight from pilot school after the two weeks leave to combat crew training for B-17 crews. They formed the crews and 10-man crews, and we started training up in the state of Washington. And then a couple months later, we all 35 crews that trained together went overseas, and we all went to the 390th bomb group. Just, just on that, get, getting together as a crew, how, 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 did, how did that work? Because you know, in the RAF, we hear that they just shoved everybody in a room and everybody got together. How, how did your crew well, get together? I, I, there was, we were in a hut, and I think there were enough people in the hut for two crews. And of course, we weren't all together there. The crew wasn't all together. This was just officers together <laughs> to start with. So pilot, co-pilot, navigator, and bombardier got together. Then they assigned six, enlisted men to us for the rest of the crew 
And if there was some incompatibility, that was where it would be decided. That, okay, yeah. Yeah. Mm. So our crew was very, very tight knit, and we all knew our job. And, and, and we trained there for a couple of months, really learning our jobs. Went out over the Pacific and shot the guns at two targets and did a lot of stuff. We, we did a lot of gun shooting, the big guns, and, and I never got to shoot one in combat. <laughs> you, you were a bit busy, I would yeah. think. <laughs> so where, 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 was, where was your crew from? Were they all over the country? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah. Our bombardier was from New York City. And uh, our navigator was, <laughs> I don't remember. And, and when we got, now, the navigator was Ed, the bombardier was Fred, and I had red hair. <laughs> so we had Ed, Fred, and Red. <laughs> that was us, the navigator, bombardier, and me. I was the co-pilot, I was 20 years old, and the pilot was a real old guy. He was 26. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So then a couple months training and we went overseas. All 35 crews went to the 390th bomb group. 35 crews all in one lump went over to the th 390th. It shows how hard a time the 390th were having. Yeah. yeah. All, all the groups yeah. were. So we filled the holes that they had and built up their force, and and we created a lot of holes pretty quickly. My crew was shot down. The crew I trained with and went over with, they were shot down on their first mission. I got sick and they threw me in the hospital, Oof. and my crew went out without me and got shot down. Oh dear. Boy, that was a shock. I got out of the hospital on Christmas Eve, 1943, came back to the base. I had to hitchhike to get back there. Uh, hitched a ride and got back to the base. So you, you were in hospital. Yeah. And they didn't take you back to the base. You had to hitch. I had to hitch a ride. <laughs> I got on a truck and I got on an ambulance at, at first. And then when he got to where he had to go, I got a truck from there on and <laughs> got home Christmas Eve. After dark, went to our hut. In our hut, there were 12 beds. Each crew had four officers. Mm -hmm. So there were the officers of three different crews. Two pilots, navigator, and a bombardier. So I found our hut. It was dark. <laughs> found our hut, opened the door, turned the light on, 12 beds. 11 of the mattresses were rolled up with no bedding. My bed was over in the corner and it was still made and my clothes were hanging there. I went across the street from our hut to the orderly room of our squadron and I went in and told the kid on duty who I was. And I said, where did you move my crew? They were right there in that hut. He said, well, I don't know, but..." Next door is the operations officer of the squadron. Go, go, go into his hut and ask him. So I went next door. The operations officer was Pen Major Pennebaker. And I went in, told him my name, and he said, oh, your crew was shot down. All three of those crews were shot down while I was gone. What a shock. Yeah. My crew was gone, the one I trained with and went over with. Were, were, they, were they killed? Did any survive? We didn't know at that time. We later found out through the Red Cross that they were prisoners of war. All 10 had wow. gotten out of the airplane and were captured. That's, luck, got, that's lucky, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I saw, after the war ended, I saw one, the navigator stayed in the service, and he and I bumped into each other a few times. So that's that's a bit of a shocking start to your your, oh. your career in, in Europe. Oh, wow, it was. How, how did you get us, what happened to get assigned to the new crew? I was the next day, I was on the next, uh, the new crew. Now there, 
their co-pilot took my place. Oh. So I was assigned to that crew to fill that spot. I think it was his fault. <laughs> I blame him for my crew going down. <laughs> he had tried one mission before that. They had flown one mission and the airplane ran out of fuel and it was badly damaged and landed in the North Sea. Now they were rescued and one man died from exposure to that cold water, but they were rescued and they got a, a week over in Scotland to kind of recuperate. <laughs> Rescue from the North I Sea, joined get, the sent, crew. get sent to Scotland to warm up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then he, he was appointed to fly in my place on my crew because I was in the hospital and they were shot down. Now he only tried twice. The first one, they didn't make it home. The second one, they didn't make it home. <laughs> if he walked in here and asked me to ride to Tucson with him, I wouldn't go. <laughs> yeah. So, so how, how, how did you fit in with the new crew? What, oh, uh, yeah, we, we became buddies very quickly. We had trained together out in Washington. Oh, now, yeah. So we barely knew each yeah. other, but we quickly... Be well, they kind of resented me at first mm. because their guy took my place and got shot down. But then we became very close, a yeah, very close crew. Yeah. So what was the B-17 like to fly? Because we hear a lot from the fighter pilots talking yeah. about things, but what, what, what about the Fortress? What, what was it like to, to the fly? The B-17 was a very stable airplane up in the air. So it was therefore very easy to fly a tight formation, mm. which was life-saving. Yeah. And it was pure cable and pulley to all control surfaces, no boost at all. So it took a little brute force to move it around, but it was a great old airplane. It took a lot of damage and made it home many, many times. So your first operation was to where? Your first mission? My first mission was uh, to bomb a chemical factory at Ludwigshafen, Germany. And I went back there a couple times after that to Ludwigshafen to bomb that same factory. So it was uh, very important to the, to the war effort because we understood they were making synthetic oil, which mm -hmm. was very important to the war effort to lubricate the engines. And so uh, we went back several times to finish them off. When you arrived in England, did people talk about what it was like or was it very quiet? So did you have any inkling of what you were about to expect when well, you go over there? No, we didn't because in my hut, we were all new crews. <laughs> and so we, we didn't have any <laughs> experience to talk about then. Now, when I got out, it was quite different. And when I got out of the hospital. Yeah. And uh, so we, but we got to be good friends with other crews, mm -hmm. you know, and then pretty soon you didn't want to become too friendly because mm -hmm. they might not come back. Yeah. It was a scary time. So those are early, because we, we always read that the, the early missions for a new crew were the, the dangerous ones. Yes. How, what, when you guess sort of off the base, you get up, you have heavy bomb load, that must have been nerve wracking, getting into, just getting into formation. What happened with the, the losses on the first mission, mm -hmm. our second mission, is that the new crew straggled from the formation at high altitude with a heavy airplane. We had never had any training in flying a very heavy airplane at very high altitude in a tight formation. Now we had flown formation, but 
and we'd flown at high altitude with a light airplane back in our training, but we never had that combination. Heavy airplane, high altitude type formation. First time up there, they straggled from the formation and got picked off. That's what happened to my crew. They straggled. They were up over Bremen, Germany, and and uh, dropped their bombs and straggled from the formation as it made the turn away and got picked off. The first time I got the controls up there, I did the same thing. But I learned very quickly. <laughs> I, I, I guess it's the muscle memory for that heavy aircraft in, in light well, air. Well, it, it was a matter of uh, the tiny adjustments of power mm -hmm. to stay right in that position. And once you learned that, it was very easy. But the new guy took a while to learn it. You know, he fell back and fell back, and then he added more power and more power, and then he went by, mm -hmm. and then he slowed down, and so he was all over the sky. It's too bad we didn't have some high altitude heavy airplane training in the States to learn that, but uh, that didn't happen. So it, it's, as you get more experiences, you're, you're making smaller adjustments yes, on, on all the controls. very tiny, and you stay right there. You, if you move, you're looking at a particular spot on the fuselage, mm -hmm. if you move a couple inches, you're correct for it. And so once you learn, oh, it was so easy, once you learned how to stay there. But it took a while, and then, uh, it was easier. I got really adept at flying formation. After I got to be 21, I got checked out as first pilot and got my own crew. So uh, moving moving seats and, and getting your own crew, I guess that's, that's exciting. You're the commander. Where did that crew come from? Was that stragglers from other Part of them were my old crew yeah. that had not finished up. Okay. You know, they had maybe skipped some missions because of illness or whatever. So part of them were my old crew, but I got cast offs and, and guys that had been sick and didn't couldn't fly with their crew. And so I, I formed a crew and we flew together. Fortunately, my flight engineer was the guy I had flown with a lot and I knew him <laughs> and trusted him. And so. He stayed with me until I finished. So I, I've, I'm one of these people that reads lots of books and thinks I know something. I know nothing, but I'm with a gentleman who, who does. We can look at diagrams and pictures of Messerschmitts and Fokker Wolfs and things. When you cross the coast into Europe, and I guess the, you know, you don't, you, your early missions, you didn't have fighter cover the whole way. We, we, no, yeah. not the whole way. Yeah. We, when I first got there, we had P-47 and P-38. Mm -hmm. The P-47 could just about go to the, to the border of Germany, mm -hmm. and then they had to turn around and go back. The 38s could go farther, but they were not as adaptable as mm -hmm. the ME-109, the FW-190. Those two were very formidable mm -hmm. fighters. How, how quickly would you start encountering trouble? Well, as soon as we hit the coast, we're being fired upon mm -hmm. by any aircraft because, you know, all those coastal countries were Germany yeah. then. And so then uh, along the way, there were patches of any aircraft, but our routes were designed to steer us away from major black installations. Mm -hmm. So when we got to the target, though, we were in heavy flak on yeah. every target was heavily defended. So we were taking a lot of hits over in the target area mm -hmm. when we were on the bomb run and, and getting out of there after, the, <laughs> after we dropped the bombs. As a pilot in command of a, a big aircraft like a B-17, what was it like when you had to hand control over to the bombardier? Uh, we did not do that. You didn't? Except the lead airplane in the lead squadron of each group. And 
Only one bombardier in the whole group was looking through his bomb sight. Okay. And he had control of the lead airplane. All other bombardiers were watching his airplane as we're on the bomb run. And they had their release buttons in their hand. And when he opened his bomb bay doors, everybody opened their bomb bay doors as we're proceeding down the bomb run. And then they watched very carefully when the nose of the first bomb nosed out of his airplane, everybody hit their buttons and our bombs began coming out. So it was, a, they came out in what we call the string, yeah. one after the other. Yeah. So that, that was actually gonna be my next question. Watch, watching up, so even if you're quite far back, you're, as, soon as, as soon as you see them go, everybody's dropping. Yes, and they all, all now all of us in our group mm -hmm. dropped. And then there was another group behind us. The Norden bomb site was a, quite a, a good instrument for the day. <laughs> Rather primitive, you know, <laughs> now. But it could not calculate what the winds were between us and the ground. So the first group to bomb that target was pretty sure to miss. <laughs> <laughs> And let's say we're the first group and all of our bombs drift to the left because the winds affected the flight. They were dumb bombs with no steering, yeah. you know. Now the next group, the lead bombardier was watching where our bombs hit. So he corrected to the right if ours drifted left. Mm -hmm. And he and his made, and he knew about how far and his would, may land right on the target. So it was a matter of correction. Several groups bombed the same target. Would you have, I'm trying to form this right, really. If you're in that first group and you've, would you have known that, say, your bombs drift, or as the pilot, all you care about is guessing your aircraft away and out and on the way home? No, yeah, we didn't, we couldn't do anything about where yeah. they hit, so we, you know, the, the lead airplane, as, after he drops, he made the turn away from the target to uh, head back toward home. And everybody, that lead airplane of the lead squadron, the other two squadrons, see we had a lead squadron, a low squadron, and a high squadron. The other two squadrons followed that lead airplane. But only one guy, now we didn't even have a bomb site in every airplane. Really? No. Mm -hmm. They were highly classified, and they may put six of them in the whole formation in case that lead got shot mm -hmm. down. Somebody else could take over and drop the bomb. But the bombardier in that lead airplane was actually flying the airplane when we were on the bomb run. The pilot had put it on autopilot, and uh, as they hit the the bomb run, he flipped a switch down here and on the pedestal and that gave control to the bomb site. Mm -hmm. Now, as he made tiny corrections on the bomb site, that lead airplane followed what he was doing. And of course, all of us followed what that lead <laughs> airplane was doing. So if he made turns, we all turned. The, one, of, one of the um, displays in there is the, the Berlin mission in, in, in March 44. Were you, were you on that one? I was on the 6th of March. That was the night. Yeah. I was on the 6th of March, the first time a mass of airplanes came to Berlin in the daytime. The first full daylight raid on Berlin. Okay, let's do this then. You're in the briefing room, 6th of March, 44. The curtain comes back and you see Berlin. What's the reaction? Well... It was not too drastic that time because, <laughs> let's see, that was the sixth. The third and the fourth, we had been briefed for the same target. And we, <laughs> so we tried on those two days, but turned back. All, all those two missions never got to Berlin. But now we tried, the Germans knew we were going there so what did they do? They moved all the fighters up into that area. 
On the 6th of March, we lost 69 heavy bombers, 69 over Germany. Now we lost some, came back and crashed and never flew again. But 69 over Germany. We were, we, there was an estimate of fighter attack. They estimated that we encountered 600 enemy airplanes on our way in and on our way out. Now our formation was 94 miles long, yep. so there were a lot of airplanes going into Berlin. There were several different targets around the edge. But we lost 69 airplanes on the 6th, but we got to a, our target and decimated it. It was completely eliminated. It was a, an electrical equipment manufacturing company <laughs> that first day. That that operation has been written, that mission, sorry, it's been written about quite a lot and Alfred Price wrote his book about it and, yeah. and things. From from you in the cockpit, did it did it mean something more that it was Berlin? Yes, it was it was exciting to be on that first mission to get there. Uh, there is a book written about it called Target Berlin mm -hmm. and it's from both sides, German and American. And I bought the book way many years ago and donated it to the museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if they still have it or not. But I, I have it on my shelf at home. <laughs> yeah, Target Berlin. Yeah. That was about that mission. The, I don't know how to ask, when you come under attack, you know, for someone who reads many accounts and fighter pilots always talk about yeah dancing in the sky and, and rubbish like that for a bomber pilot who knows you have to stay in formation you need to keep steady you need to give your gunners the best chance to defend how does that feel knowing that you can't do anything other than stay in formation when there's lots of stuff coming at you yeah it, it was when you're on the controls, you can't see what's going on out there. So, you know, you're looking at that airplane that you're flying formation on, so you can't see all the fighters in the flak and that stuff. When we were in the target area in heavy flak, the fighters left us alone because they didn't want to get shot down by their own guns. So they stayed outside and waited for us to come out. So it was, yeah. We didn't have any fighter attacks in the target area, but it was scary, you know, that, uh, oh boy, there's nothing you could do about it to change it. When the fighters are coming at you or when you're in heavy flight, mm -hmm. you just hope they could hold together and get you out of there. Yeah. Hope, hope that you're the, the right hole in the sky. That, that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we're at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, in our Hangar 5 uh, with more World War II aircraft. The aircraft behind us is a consolidated PB4Y2 privateer, which was a Navy patrol bomber derived from the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Um, as you notice, there's massive differences between this and the Liberator. The fuselage looks kind of the same, it's actually an extended fuselage because there's more crew um, we need for like radar operators and um, and other additional crew members that were on the Navy patrol aircraft. Uh, it also did not have superchargers on the engines because they didn't fly at higher altitudes like the B-24 did, which also allowed them to rotate the engines 90 degrees. You also notice it has a single tail um, versus the twin tail on the B-24. Uh, the other thing that's interesting in this aircraft too is just its armament loadout is a little bit more. It has two top turrets, it has a uh, nose turret, tail turret, and two actual powered side turrets. Um, they were essentially used for patrol bombing, which would be, you know, searching for and attacking Japanese shipping and Japanese submarines, um, as well as bombing Japanese held islands. This aircraft is an actual combat veteran. It flew out of the Aleutian Islands for the last few months of the war, um, doing patrol missions 
uh, over northern Japan and bombing the Kuril Islands north of Japan that have, are a series of islands that have always kind of been contested between Russia and the Japanese. Uh, a bunch of privateers were modified after the war as fire bombers. They were given different engines and then ha usually had their guns all taken off and were heavily modified to fight fires. Um, they were using them up until I think about the early 2000s when they started retiring them because of like um, metal fatigue and issues that they're having with the aircraft, uh, you know, that had been flying for 50 years plus in also very bad environments. But I've always thought this is a pretty unique aircraft. It's one of the only, this is the only privateer currently on display that has been modified back into its patrol bomber variant with the proper engines and all the turrets and all the radar and antennas on it. Um, so externally, this looks like it did in 1945 when it was uh, flying combat. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. This is a stupid question, and I'm very good at stupid questions. <laughs> Did it become any easier the more operation, the more missions that you flew? I think so, because mm -hmm. I became very adept at flying formation. Mm -hmm. And so that became easy. And you kind of absorbed the the flak around you and uh, the fighters coming at you. And, uh, well, that's the way it is. You know? Familiar, familiarity and a bit of contempt because yeah. you, you know it's coming. But it was still scary no mm. matter what. The, the other side of things are, I always wanted to ask a B-17 pilot. You, they always say we could absorb a lot of damage. What happens when your aircraft takes, say, flak damage or something. As the pilot, is it highly noticeable that the aircraft is behaving wrong? Well, yeah, you became aware. <laughs> behaving wrong, that's yeah, terrible. I lost <laughs> eight engines during, <laughs> during 20 Not all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the most at any time was two, and that was on my last mission. I've heard about that. We're going to come <laughs> back to that one. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, we lost one many times, but uh, all due to enemy action. Mm -hmm. It was not mechanical failure. Mm -hmm. So we lost them due to what the enemy did. And uh, we got home sometimes badly damaged and landed somewhere other than home. There was a, a one mile no, it was bigger than that. Probably a mile and a half of pavement square in England. We knew where it was, and we landed on that one time because we had an engine that was red hot and maybe going to catch fire, <laughs> and we weren't, weren't sure where we, whether we could make it home or not, so we landed there. So but, the B-17 could be trimmed out quite well when you were dragging and, 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 and yeah. things. Yeah. yeah, it was a good... You could trim it, and it stayed there, you know, very nicely. A good old airplane. <laughs> but brute force only. <laughs> Let's ask the B-24 question. I flew it. Yeah. After I got back. What, wh how would you compare the two? I, when I flew the B-24, I was, it was in test pilot school after I got back. And I said, oh, I'm so glad I didn't have to fly <laughs> this one in combat. It was a very unstable airplane in the air, and those skinny wings couldn't take the damage that the B-17 could. So it was a very susceptible airplane to getting bad, badly damaged and going down, mm -hmm. and, uh, and very unstable in the air. So it would have been very difficult to fly a tight formation. And I think the formation saved lives. Example, on that first daylight raid on Berlin, the first time a mass of airplanes got there, we had 30 airplanes in our group that day, and we lost one. The 100th group 
which was in our wing and either flew ahead of us or behind us at all times, put up 30 and lost 50. Now their formation was all over the sky. So the Germans loved that, you know, <laughs> and they lost 15 out of 30. We lost one. They went the same place we did. But, but, but they're getting the TV show. Yeah. <laughs> Their nickname was the Bloody Hundred, and they deserved it. Yeah, they were pretty bad, their losses. It was a, a story was told over there, and we don't know if it's true or not, that one of their airplanes with their square and whatever, I don't remember which letter they had, but it had a different letter than us, was badly damaged and surrendered. To surrender, you put the landing gear down. And then German airplanes would come up to you without thinking to shoot you down, but to escort you someplace where you could land that airplane. And as the Germans approached, whatever their problem was, got partially corrected. So the pilot said, and the hell with this, we're not going to surrender, shoot them down. So they did that, and that was the story. And from then on, the story was, they're looking for that, air, that group with that square and that number or letter. I don't know, they were D or G or something. I don't remember what they were. So you're happy with your J? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Bill prompted me with, with this question. And it was, you flew your 25, and the Army Air Force decided that actually 30 was the number. Yeah. You managed 28, and the 28th was pretty eventful. Oh, God. Before your, do you want to tell us a little bit about your, your last mission before you came home? It was to bomb an aircraft factory at Augsburg, Germany. Augsburg is way down in southeast Germany, so it's a long haul down there. I think, I think they figured for seven and a half hours of flight time, for the total flight time. And so we started down there, 21 of us in the standard formation. And, you know, across the coast we got a little flak and then a little flak along the way, and then, you know, we were getting shot at along the way. But when we got to the bomb run, it, that target was heavily defended. So we were on the bomb run and just taking a lot of hits along there. So all of us are taking hits. We got to the target and dropped our bombs and lost three of our airplanes right there over the target. They went down right over the target. We heard that one of them made it down to Sweden or Switzerland. We could see the, the lake on the, on the edge of Switzerland from where we were over that target. And we could see the border of Switzerland. So we heard that one of them got there, but the other two went kaplunk and were lost. So as we turned away, now all of us had some damage, but we're headed back toward uh, England. My little ball turret called and said, we got oil running off the wing behind number one engine. <laughs> My question to him was, how fast is it running? <laughs> and he said, well, it's not a gusher, but it's a steady stream. So <laughs> those were his words. <laughs> they were very significant. A gusher meant a lot of oil was coming out. So I kept it running as we proceeded home. We over, as we were approaching the Belgium border, we're still in Germany, but approaching. It's not significant because it was Germany all the way in yeah. the And so that's where we were uh, still in Germany. And there was a big cloud bank up over us, uh, our route. And so we diverted around it. You can't take a formation mm. into cloudy yeah. bag into each other, <laughs> losing airplane. So 
the diversion took us right over a German airfield. Not a good place to be. <laughs> and, oh my God, the flak was very accurate and a lot of it, and it was seemed like, it was, to me, it was going off every burst in our formation. It, it was a bit personal, was it? Oh boy, it was really terrible. There were only 18 of us left in the group. And they were all taking some pretty serious damage. As we left there now, my little ball turret gunner called out, we got oil gushing out of number two and number three. <laughs> now, number one's leaking oil all the way from the target. We're about two and a half hours from there now. No quantity gauge on our oil. Oil pressure only. Kind of like your automobile. You don't know how much oil's in yeah. that tank, but you know the oil pressure. So I didn't know how long number one was going to keep running. But number two and three were gushing great quantities of oil. So I got the flight engineer out of the top turret and had him stand right between me and the co pilot. I had a co pilot I had never flown with before, and I didn't know what he could do. <laughs> didn't trust him. And so I got the flight engineer out of the top turret and had him stand here. And then I said to him, uh, you have complete authority to hit a feather button if you see oil pressure dropping. Three of our engines are leaking oil. And so he's standing there hanging on the back of the pilot's co-pilot seat. Feather button, you know what it was, mm. big round red button. Yep. <laughs> and about four or five minutes, an arm came over my shoulder and hit number two. And the prop fed it. I shut the engine down. Number two, manifold, it furnished a little warm air to the cockpit, blown in with a blower across our windshield to defrost the windshield. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I shut that engine down, the warm air stopped. <laughs> <laughs> and zip, frosted up right away. All over the cockpit, I couldn't see out the to fly formation. So I, 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 fortunately, I could back out. I backed out the side and back, got out of formation. And now we're a single cripple in enemy territory <laughs> and not an enviable position. Mm -hmm. And within another four minutes or so, an arm over my shoulder hit number three, and it was too late. We had lost too much engine oil. There was not enough left to feather the prop. Now the engine was completely without oil, and the prop was making the pistons go in and out without oil. It didn't take long, a couple of minutes, and the friction was so great that that engine became red hot and stopped. It just seized. And the prop was going with such force that it tore the reduction gears between the prop and the engine, tore them all apart. Now the prop is no longer connected to the engine. So it's it's just... out there spinning. <laughs> so it was dragged to me. Number one is running but leaky oil all the way from the target. Number two is shut down and feathered. Number three is windmilling and a lot of drag. Number four was a good engine. So you've just got your outboard engines left. That's yeah. all that's running. Yeah. And not sure when that one's going to quit. I had everybody ready. If we were over land, I was going to bail them out if that one quit. Because you can't fly the thing. You can go some distance, but can't fly it on one engine, out, outboard engine. So uh, if we were over water, I would land in the water, ditch it, and it, it was a good airplane to ditch. We had rafts, we could get in. So it was kind of scary, everybody was, I told them to all get a hold of their seat and lift up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we went back 
I headed straight for England, all by myself. And I knew how to get to our base. <laughs> I, we had a homer beacon mm -hmm. there, so I, I tuned that in and I headed straight for it. And I had 22,000 feet, so that was good. I had air below me, a lot of good air. <laughs> and so I gradually descended all the way back, and I, I got down low enough that the thing defrosted and I could see out. And I got near our base, and everybody was already there, the guys that had more <laughs> engines than I did. And they were shooting flares. Wounded was a red flare. And mechanical difficulties was a green flare. <laughs> Looked like Christmas <laughs> over the base. <laughs> red and green flares flying all over. I, I got there and had to make one complete circle of the airfield before I could get on the final. And I got on the final to our long runway. That was the one we were using that day. 6,300 feet. That's a pretty skimpy run. <laughs> <laughs> and I deliberately carried some extra speed down the final because of my condition. I didn't want to settle out and land short because I didn't have the power to pick it up yep. if it started to settle out. On. So I carried some extra speed down the final on purpose. So therefore, I hit down the runway a little bit farther than normal and going a little bit faster than normal. Hit the brakes, and there weren't any. <laughs> 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 now, I'm going down that runway at 80 miles an hour. That was my airspeed when I landed. And it's not slowing down very rapidly. <laughs> you know, I had about a mile left, and that goes by pretty fast at 80 miles an hour. And it was maybe slowing down to 60 or 50 by the time I got close to the end. I was still going pretty fast when I got close to the end. I was six or 700 feet from the end of the runway. I ground looped the airplane by applying full power on number one, made it turn sharply to the right, and then straighten it with number four. And then both of them to get me clear of the runway. Thank God for English mud. <laughs> Good old gooey English mud. Grabbed that airplane and stopped it. Oh my God, we were so glad. <laughs> the ten of us crawled off and we're standing there in the mud looking at this airplane that brought us home and just being so thankful we had made it back to England. One man was wounded, but we had him all patched up. He got hit in the jaw and the guys pulled a piece of flak out and put a band-aid on it to get him home. And we were oh, uh, standing there in the mud. The crew chief, they're always watching when the came home, group came home to see if their airplane, one of the ones that made it. That day, three of ours did not make it. Well, the crew chief for this airplane saw his airplane land, and it didn't look very good. It was covered with oil on the bottom, full of holes, and one engine was, the prop was feathered, and the other one, the prop was just flopping around out here. <laughs> <laughs> and then he saw me put it in the mud. <laughs> and he got on his bike and he rode as far as he could and slogged out through the mud to where we were. And he stood there looking at that airplane, shaking his head. And he turned to me and said, gee, Lieutenant, what'd you do to my airplane? <laughs> I said, well, let's get that part straight. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> the Germans did that. <laughs> I just put it in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happened. 25 days later, he had it completely repaired and it flew a mission. Wow. And was shot down. Oh. And eight were killed and two were taken prisoner. That was the next mission on that airplane. <laughs> but you were done. I was done. Yeah. 
boy, was I glad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly, I didn't want to do that again. <laughs> so the trip home, how, how long did it take from, from slogging out of the, the Suffolk mud to getting back stateside? What, what's the, what's was, the process for getting see, home? That was the 13th of April, mm -hmm. and I landed in New York on the 30th of May. Oh. So I was still on the base for another three or four weeks. And I was flying as instructor pilot with new crews to, in practice missions around England and uh, test flights and whatever they needed. And so uh, yeah, I had something to keep me busy all the time. And I finally got orders back to the States and came home by troop ship. And where I went to the place where they gathered people to put them on the ship. I went into my assigned room. It was two bunks, an upper and a lower. And the upper was already taken, so I threw my stuff on the lower, went in to get something to eat, came back, and my bunkmate was there. It was Don Gentile, the leading ace in Europe. <laughs> he was my top cover for the night. <laughs> Boy, he was a great guy. And uh, so we... You had fight a cover all the way home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he and his wingman were coming back for a big bond drive, you know. Mm. He, I think he had 21 victories at that time. Yeah. So you, you, you stayed in. You, well, when, yeah, when it, I, I did. I went through test pilot school there, then to Boeing factory as a test pilot on B-29s. That was a great job. T test pilot on B-29, that, that seems as hazardous as, as flying missions. Well, it was uh, uh, at the factory, you know, and I had brand new airplanes to fly every day, and nobody was shooting at me. <laughs> I liked that job. E even though the B-29 was a bit... Bit picky. Oh no, we had, you know, when we we were flying them in Wichita, mm. the weather is entirely different than those islands out in the Pacific, and we were flying them very light, you know, for yeah. test flight. We just had fuel on for a couple hours. And <laughs> so they were lovely then. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, they had engine problems, engine overheating out there because several things. It was hot. Mm -hmm. They were down at very low level, and they were heavily loaded, and they're taking off, you know, heavily loaded, and the engine, they got some engine overheating problems down there, and so the factory and we were trying to do something to help that, so we were testing their new stuff that they put on, mm -hmm. and, and we had to test fly every one of them. So that was a requirement. They were turning those things out at a huge rate of us. Yeah, four and a half a day out of that yeah. factory in Wichita. It was what I was showing my wife around the, the B-29 here. Yeah. And it it literally blew her mind a bit because she couldn't, she'd only ever heard of it. It was the plane that dropped the atomic bomb there. Yeah. She'd never seen it. So when we showed her like the, the tube from the, the forward, she, she was like, okay, I, I, it's time to go home. She said that was the one that did it because it was just so big, yeah. and it, yeah, it, it was it was quite I, something. And four four and a half a day coming yeah. out of Wichita is yeah. just mind blowing. I, and I, uh, oh, 10, 12 years ago, I got out my Form Five and I counted every B twenty nine I flew while I was there at the factory. I flew two hundred and twenty six B twenty nines at the Whoa. factory. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, I, I, I've kept you for, for long enough, and I know there's many, there's much more to tell, Korea and, and, oh, and places like that. But well, I just want to thank you for spending the last little while with me talking talking about <laughs> fortresses. You know, I, I, uh, they had a big celebration for my 98th birthday year, almost two years ago. And because it, there's, there's another big one coming up shortly, isn't there? Yeah, my 100th yeah. is coming up next month. But they didn't think I'd make any more, I guess. So <laughs> they had a big celebration. And uh, they, 
they told me that I started working over there as a docent in 1992. I've been doing that for over 30 years on Thursday. Every Thursday for 30 years at the 390 Youth Museum. Yeah. They do like you rather a lot over there. I, I, I've, I've noticed that. Everybody says, yeah, Richard, yesterday it was Richard's in tomorrow. You've got to meet Richard. And then when they said you were going to chat with me, I was very happy. Oh, God. Listen. Yeah, it's a love now, you know, mm. that museum. And you, you've got a copy of my book. I don't, no. I wrote a book. Oh, we should have brought one over for it. Uh, got on the truck and car. We'll you got a whole bunch of them in the car. <laughs> we'll figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. But uh, I wrote a book yeah. about my wars. My wars, wars. Yeah. with an S. <laughs> Some Did people don't know when to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, well, okay, if, if you've got a minute, Korea yeah. is the one that nobody really talks about. I was, when I got back from that mm -hmm. tour, they sent me to test pilot school then the Boeing yeah. factory. And then the war ended and I got out of the air for, uh, off of active duty mm -hmm. into reserve. And it took a year before the reserve was even slightly organized. And by then, there was a base about 30 miles from where I was living, and they had B-50s and B-29s, <laughs> and I was assigned to the test flight section. So I went up there a couple of days a month and flew B-50s and B-29s. And then they called me at night and said, report for duty tomorrow morning. You are on active duty. The Korean War had started. <laughs> so. Then they sent me back to school in uh, Chinook in Illinois for maintenance management. They said, you know all about airplanes and you're a test pilot, so you ought to <laughs> go to maintenance management <laughs> school so you can be a manager in the maintenance business. So from then on, I was in the aircraft maintenance business as well as flying. So I ended up getting into higher and higher positions in in maintenance management. I was chief of maintenance at, at uh, Fighter Wing in Da Nang, Vietnam. That was my last combat. So I was the chief of maintenance of the wing. I was a colonel by then. So you, you, you were doing the, the crew chief walking up to battered planes going, what have you done to my plane? <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah, and I was, I was responsible for the airplanes and all the equipment mm -hmm. on the whole base and the bombs and, oh, God. <laughs> and then I got to be the DM of the base, and so I was re responsible for everything, supply and maintenance. <laughs> it was quite a chore. But uh, then when I left Vietnam, I went to, I got a plus job at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Ooh, very nice. I was on the panhandle, and I was the deputy commander for logistics in Air Force Special Operations. Oh, in the command headquarters. Oh, what a great job that was. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally I got quarters on the base, and my backyard was grass, went out like this, dropped off and there was the beach. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, that, that's worth it after all those years. If they had left me there, I'd still be on active duty <laughs> at 100 years old. <laughs> but uh, I got the assignment down and I was at Eglin. Yeah. And I, they said, OK, you're going out to Canada. You have F-111 experience, and they're in trouble. They have an F-111 wing in big trouble. OK. <laughs> So I said, somebody fly me out there and let me take a look at my job. And I was no longer flying, by the mm -hmm. way, and uh, still got flight pay. <laughs> 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 and so they flew me out in a T-39. I 
checked my job over, checked out the quarters I was going to get, and just so we'd know what was going to happen. And I was ready to go back. But the weather sucked in, and they couldn't get in to get me. So I called the railroad station in downtown Clovis, and I said, I'd like to get a train out of here back east somewhere, like maybe Oak City, where they can fly in to get me. And the guy said, sir, to get out of Clovis on a train, you have to be a cow. <laughs> They had cattle yards yeah. all over that area, and no passenger <laughs> trains at all. <laughs> oh, oh boy! So, so I had to wait till the weather cleared, then they got in to get me. But you took the assignment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I took it. Yeah. I was there. They needed help, and so I had F one eleven experience. I was there. Uh, Chief of Maintenance at Nellis when we got the first F 111s mm -hmm. in the whole Air Force. And Australians and Americans, we were training them yep. at, at Nellis Air Force Base. So I, <coughs> they caught up with me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was there for oh, two and a half years, I guess. Strange airplane, the F 111. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it was. Sort of was, was sold to do everything. But yeah, did, but did a couple of things well and a lot of things not so well. The guys that flew it said it's a great experience. You have the computer program to fly at high altitude and then descend hands off to treetop level. He said try that at night sometime. Oh dear. No thanks. <laughs> oh, it's made my stomach feel a bit strange. Oh. Oh my God. Uh, you, you, that's a lot of trust. <laughs> I never flew it. I could have, you know. All I had to say was, I want to go because we had instructors all yeah. over the place. You know? I missed that one and the 105 both. Uh, mm. And I was. Chief of Magnus and both of them. Oh, right. I was chatting to Russ Violet about the 105 yesterday, yeah. yeah. It's, it was a good airplane, but, mm. you know, uh, it had its problems. Yep. There was a place in Vietnam called Thud Ridge where many of them went down. And, well, we lost a lot of F-4s, too. Mm. You know. But that was a good airplane. I finally got to Mach 2.1 in an F-4. So that's, and I flew helicopters at yeah. zero speed. So that's my range of speed, zero to Mach 2.1. <laughs> Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. And oh, it's, it's been a real pleasure for, for me to, to be able to spend a bit of time with you. So. Well, I tell stories every Thursday. Yeah, every, yeah. so if, if, if you're in Tucson on a Thursday, <laughs> come down to Pima, head over to the 390s, meet Richard. Yeah, I can't I'm there him. every Thursday. Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise now. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds grammatically incorrect, but it, it was a statement made by a senator who was in charge of Indian affairs and he was down in Alabama on a mission down there. And he was, they sent a message down there, report back to Washington on this date. He replied, I will be there on that date. The good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. He meant the creek Indians. <laughs> they were between him and Washington. <laughs> that afternoon, chatting with Dick about his his life and his career was an incredible highlight for me especially doing this podcast and I've been sitting on this interview now for over six months because I've been hoping to tie it up with of course Masters of the Air which tells the story of the 390th sister group the 100th bomb group the bloody 100th and of course Apple's never put it out so we'll re-up this should they ever do that now you've got the bird's eye view of what one pilot in the 390th thought of the 100th. Anyways, enough of that. 
if you want to know more about Dick's career, he's written a book. It's called My Wars, and we'll pop a link into the description below. He did very kindly sign a copy for me, and it is fascinating. The stuff about the B-29s flying out of Wichita is superb. He still goes every Thursday to the museum and chats to people about his friends and his experience, and he really is a gem. So I can't thank Bill Buckingham and the team at the 390th Memorial Museum enough for setting that all up. And of course, to the team at our fabulous sponsors, the Pima Air and Space Museum, who you have to go to Tucson and spend many days looking around both museums. Now, links to both of them are in the description below, as I said, along with Dick's book. Next week, we're staying in the museum game, but we're taking a slightly different tact as we talk to Maggie Appleton, who's the CEO of the RAF Museums here in the UK. We're going to be talking about the history, the future, the purpose of the RAF Museums. It's very much a conversation like we had with Scott Marchand about Pima, and we're going to be having with other museums as we go forward. Just a quick note to say thank you very much for putting up with my two weeks off. I've been moving house. I'm coming to you now from my little cubby office in the back of the house. We're in, which means I've got podcasts to catch up on. So thank you for your patience and thank you for your support. As always, if you want to become a damn castier, that is over on Patreon. Link in the description below. Just three pounds a month plus a bit of that. But times are tough. I understand that. So please, if you fancy sharing the pod, tell your friends, pop some stars into your podcast app of choice. It's been really humbling seeing the very generous reviews you've been leaving. Thank you so much. I shall continue to strive to keep up the standard. And we've got some really fun stuff coming up over the next couple of months. So until next time, when we talk to Maggie, thanks again for your support. Do take care of yourselves. Bye bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowe and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.